It's almost impossible to talk about web frameworks in general, so we're going to cover a specific one in this unit called Web2Py, which is a framework for Python. Web2Py was created in 2007 by a guy named Massimo Di Piero, who created it originally for the purposes of teaching web programming in his university courses. From there it grew into a proper full-fledged framework, and is now developed and maintained by the creator Massimo himself, and an online community of developers, which is possible because it's released under an open source license, specifically the lesser GPL version 3. Web2Py is now my framework of choice, as I find the API is very well thought out, uh, the only downside to it being that it only supports Python 2 rather than Python 3. Web2Py certainly isn't alone among Python projects that have been very slow to adopt Python 3, but hopefully Python 3 support will show up uh, pretty soon, sometime in the next couple of years. A unique selling point of Web2Py is how easy it is to get up and running. In fact, you could just go to the website, choose the appropriate download for your platform, whether that's Linux, Mac, or Windows, and then unzip the download, and inside you'll find uh, an executable, run that executable, and then you'll see this prompt asking you to specify a server IP, a server port, and a password. The server IP has the default value 127.0.0.1, which is a local private IP address uh, just for your local host system. Uh, the server port is by default 8000, which is a sensible number. So unless there's some conflict with some other uh, server running on your system, 8000 should be fine. And, and then the password, uh, you can leave that blank, but you should fill it in. Otherwise, the uh, and some, some features are left disabled unless you have a password for security reasons. Certain features would be dangerous without a proper password on your server, so Web2Py will disable them if you don't provide a password. So, fill in a password, click Start. This will then start the built-in web server which is included with Web2Py called Rocket, which is not a web server you would use in, in, in a real production site. It, it serves its purpose here for um, demonstration purposes and just getting up and running and uh, playing around with Web2Py, but for a real website you would want to use Apache. Which, of course, you can do with Web2Py, but uh, we're not going to do it because that's a lot of distracting configuration stuff to go over. In any case, so Rocket, the built-in web server, is launched, running on the local host address 127.0.0.1 with port 8000. Once the server is running, which should only take a moment, uh, Web2Py will then automatically open your browser and take you to the URL 127.0.0.1 with on port 8000 with the path welcome slash default slash index, which is just the default example page when we launch Web2Py in this manner. Now, something somewhat unusual about Web2Py is that it has this concept of applications. In one running instance of Web2Py, whether it's using Apache as its web server or Rocket or whatever as its web server, that one instance of Web2Py potentially has multiple applications installed and running. And what an application is, is just a, sort of a logically separate site. I mean, normally you go to a domain name like yahoo.com and you think of it as just being one site. Um, but potentially, at least, uh, Web2Py allows you to develop separate applications and host them on the same domain. Nothing forces you to do this, of course. And in fact, in most professional web development, you know, you'll create a site for one domain name. And it's not really a usual thing to do to have multiple separate sites all under one domain name. So this multi-application paradigm is a bit strange, but it's handy if we need it. In any case, if you look in the directory where we have Web2Py installed, you'll find a subdirectory called Applications, and then in Applications we have subdirectories each named for the particular applications. So if I have an application named Foo, it'll be in a subdirectory of Applications called Foo. And then in each application directory we have a number of subdirectories, uh, most notably one called controllers, one called models, and one called views. So logically the way Web2Py is structured is that first again we have potentially more than one application in each install of Web2Py and then within each application uh, you have some number of controller modules and inside those controller modules you have one or more what Web2Py calls actions and an action really is just a function. What Web2Py calls a controller is just an ordinary module of Python code, and the actions contained within are just ordinary functions. The basic idea is that each incoming request gets processed by one particular action, and which action is specified by the URL of the request. And what Web2Py calls a controller is a little deviant from the term as it's used in MVC, a model view controller, 
because in Web2Py, a controller is simply just a model that contains some number of actions. It's almost more proper to think of the actions as really being the controllers in terms of the MVC architecture, but, but Web2Py simply chose to call them actions, and the controller modules are really just logical groupings of different actions. So if you have a number of related actions, it makes sense to place them together in one particular controller module. So given an incoming request, how does Web2Py decide which action to execute to process that request? Well, the pattern is simply that looking at the path of the URL, first is specified the name of the application, and then after a slash is specified the name of the controller module, and then after another slash is specified the name of the particular action function within that controller module. And after the action name, we can put another slash, but that's just optional. It doesn't matter if we put one there or not. So this is the structure for URLs which Web2Py expects, though actually it will also accept URLs which only contain an application and a controller, or just an application, or actually nothing, like say just an empty path. And what's going on here is that if you leave out the action, then Web2Py assumes the default action name, index, and if the controller is left off as well, Web2Py assumes the default controller, which is itself called default. And finally, the application, if you leave that off, Web2Py assumes the application which has been configured as the default. In Web2Py's configuration files, you can specify that I want this application to be the so-called default application. So looking back at the example page which Web2Py first presented to us, you can see the path in the URL is welcome slash default slash index. So this is the page returned by the action named index in the controller module named default in the application named welcome. The welcome application is simply an example Web2Py application that's included with the Web2Py download, so it's there by default. And initially it's configured as the default application. So here, if we entered the URL 127.0.0.1 colon 8000 slash with no path, just a slash, it would take us actually to the same page because welcome is the default application, the default controller name is called default, and the default action is called index. Another Web2Py application that comes installed with Web2Py is a special one called admin. If you navigate to admin slash default slash site, you'll see this page, though actually it will first prompt you for a password because uh, you don't want anyone to access your admin page, you only want yourself to be able to access it or people with, who are authorized. Because in this admin application, we can do anything we want to our install of Web2Py. We can, we can install and remove applications, and actually we can go in and edit the code of any of the applications. There's a web interface provided here for looking at the code and actually editing it. This web interface for modifying your code is actually a unique feature of Web2Py. You, you, of course, don't have to use it. You can edit your code like you normally would with a text editor. But it's kind of handy that this thing exists. For one, say you're not on your development machine where you don't have your code. Um, if you can log in remotely to the admin application, you can then uh, effectively change your code from anywhere you have web access. Arguably, though, the admin application then represents a pretty damn huge security hole of if your admin gets compromised, then people can do whatever they want, and you'd really be totally compromised. So you can, if you choose, disable this admin application. The thing you can't do, though, however, is actually remove, uninstall the admin application. That's why, if you look at the screen here, the admin application is listed with a little lock icon indicating that you can't either edit this application or delete it, because it's a special application. The other applications you'll see included by default, the welcome application, which we already discussed, and the examples application, those are just regular applications, so you can uninstall them if you choose. The examples application is very strangely named because it's actually the, the code that runs the Web2Py site itself, the web2py.org website. Despite the name examples, though, it doesn't really include examples. I would say welcome actually makes a better example application. In any case, if you look over on the right, you'll see where it says new simple application, and we fill in the name of an application we want to create, and then hit the create button. So I'll do that. I enter the name thing and hit create. That will create an application named thing and take me to the admin page on which I can edit this application. You'll see at the top here, it lists the name of the module files which constitute our models, first db.py and menu.py. And then you can see we have two controller modules. There's default.py and appadmin.py. And underneath that in the view section, it lists the content of the views directory in our application, which we'll talk more about later. 
So again, while you can use this page in the admin application to edit your other applications, uh, you don't have to. Um, it's a little clunky, to, to be honest. Uh, just the nature of the web browser is not all that ideal for editing code, but it is a neat feature to have in some circumstances. I would just go into the actual application directory, find the files I want to edit, open them in a text editor, and, and do it that way. So now that we've created this application thing, if we navigate to the URL with the path thing slash default slash index, uh, we will see this page. And lo and behold, it looks exactly like the page in the welcome application, except it says thing instead of welcome. The reason for this is that when we create a new application, Web2Py simply takes the welcome application as basically a template, simply making a copy of all that and swapping the name of the application to whatever you chose. So with our new applications, we start off with some basic functionality already functioning, like the ability to create a user account for application and then log in. Um, and also it provides a general template for the pages. Now, if we don't like any of that, we can strip it out. So we're not beholden to this. It's very easy to get rid of, but it's kind of nice to start with more than just a blank page. Now here in my editor of choice, I've opened the controller module called default, which is the file default.py in the directory controllers. In our new application, default.py doesn't start off life totally empty. It has a few actions in it, including, uh, very importantly, index. In the case of the index action, that's one you can edit as you see fit. A couple of the others, though, you shouldn't edit or remove for reasons we'll discuss uh, much later. For clarity, though, we should start with a blank slate. So let's create our own separate controller module, which we'll call ground control. So in the controllers directory, we create a file called groundcontrol.py and we'll open up the file and create one simple action which we'll call major tom. The function major tom note takes no parameters and all it does is return a single string, hello world. So making sure to save the groundcontrol.py file, uh, we then go to our browser and navigate to thing slash groundcontrol slash major tom. So the action major tom inside the controller module named ground control inside the application named thing. And what do we see? Well, the page just has hello world. It just has that text we returned as a string. And in the browser, if we look at the page source, you'll see that this actually isn't really HTML. There's no HTML tag with no header tag and body tag. It's just the text hello world. So when we return a string from an action, what's returned in the body of the response is just that text verbatim. It doesn't even have to be HTML. And most browsers will then render that as a page as best it can, which in this case just means rendering it as plain text. Now let's go back to the ground control module and add in a second function, which we'll call action man. This time though, we'll give the function a parameter, x. Again, making sure we save the ground control.py module file once we've finished editing it. If we now go back to the browser and enter a URL with the path thing slash ground control slash action man, Web2Py will give us a response with this error message because the function action man is actually not a proper action. It doesn't constitute as an action because it has a parameter. Web2Py expects action functions to not have any parameters. So only the functions you define without parameters in the controller modules, only those are actions. Any other function you define with a parameter, it's not an action. Come to think of it, hopefully I haven't confused you by putting action in the name of the function, which isn't an action. Now, as you saw, our action major tom returned a string. And when an action returns a string, the response that comes back is just that string verbatim. Uh, when an action returns a dictionary, however, what Web2Py will then do is generate a response from a view of the same name as the action. And views, as we'll see, are special modules located in the views directory of our application. So given a path application name slash controller name slash action name, if the action run returns a dictionary, then the response will be generated by the corresponding view file with the same name, though actually ending in the extension .html. However, if in the URL path a different extension is appended to the name of the action, then the corresponding view will be that with the same name ending in that specified extension. So here we list some examples. If the URL reads thing slash ground control slash major tom, 
Well, that doesn't have any extension specified, so the default extension is .html. So, assuming that the processing action returns a dictionary, the response will be rendered by the file found in thing, the application directory, uh, slash views, slash ground control, slash major tom dot html. Likewise, if the URL is the same but ends in the extension dot html, the same view file will still be used to render the response. However, if the extension is something else, like say dot xml, then the view file should be the one named majortom.xml, and if it's .json, it should be majortom.json. Or if the URL extension is RSS, then it's the view file named majortom.rss. Now, these view files, whether they end in .html or .xml or .json or .rss, the contents of these files aren't really what the extension implies. Uh, a view file ending in .html does not contain straight HTML, it's actually the uh, templating language uh, used by Web2Py. So it's, a, it's actually a mix of HTML and uh, Python code. And the idea is that from this HTML and this Python code, an HTML response is generated. That's why the view ends in .html, because the end product is supposed to be HTML. Likewise, for a view ending in JSON, the view file itself likely doesn't contain just JSON. It includes a mix of Python code, uh, but from that JSON and Python code, a JSON response is generated. How exactly views generate responses is something we'll get to a bit later. So now, let's sum up the story so far. First off, a request comes in, it specifies some URL path, Web2Py parses the URL to determine which action in which controller in which application does it want to process this request. What happens then is that the controller module, the entirety of it, not just the action function, is run, it's executed. And in the course of the execution, that's when the function gets defined, that we then have our function object, which we can invoke, so the action is invoked. And when it returns a dictionary, uh, that dictionary gets passed to the appropriate view, the, the view of the corresponding name to the action. Uh, the view then generates a response. And this is the body of the HTTP response, which Web2Py passes along to the web server, and the web server sends it back to the user agent. 